Our next speaker is Manan Shah. He is a senior at the Harker School interested in applied mathematics and computer science. Ever since seventh grade, he has conducted numerous research projects in topics ranging from microbiology and astronomy to computer science and bioinformatics. In his junior year, Munnan worked in a team to develop a computational system for the assessment of diabetic retinopathy in retinal images. Motivated by the difficulties caused by his grandfather's prostate cancer diagnosis last year, he spent his junior summer and senior year conducting research regarding the assessment of the severity of breast cancer from histology slide images. He conducted this research at the Harvard Medical's Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center under the guidance of Dr. Andrew Beck. Munnan has been fortunate to have the opportunity to compete and win awards at the Synopsis Championship, Intel International Science Engineering Fair, Siemens National Competition, and the Regenerin Science Talent Search. He plans to pursue his love for research and major in computer science and mathematics in college. Although, aside from these endeavors, he enjoys participating in hackathons, debate, tennis, and community service. Please welcome Munnan to the stage. All right, hi everyone, uh, my name is Manan Shah, and today I'll be discussing my work on the deep learning assessment of tumor proliferation in histopathological images uh, for categorical and molecular breast cancer severity diagnosis. So breast cancer is the most common cancer in women worldwide, uh, with over 1.7 million new cases diagnosed each year. And current methods of assessing breast cancer are extremely problematic, primarily because the pathologists that currently assess uh, breast cancer from histology slides are over 25% inaccurate. Um, tumor proliferation is an important biomarker indicative of breast cancer patients' prognosis, and the accurate and efficient assessment of this biomarker is critical to develop proper patient treatment plans. Oh, that's the wrong way. Uh, so current methods for assessing tumor proliferation are both categorical and molecular in nature. The categorical score is defined as the mean number of mitoses over 10 randomly sampled tissue regions in this slide, and these scores can range from one to three, where a higher score indicates a worse prognostic outcome. So over here you can see the uh, procedure for identifying tumor proliferation, where we have 10 uh, selected images. When we identify 10 random regions, we can subsequently call the number of mitoses over these 10 regions and make a prediction simply regarding the number of mitoses over these regions. This is the procedure that pathologists currently use. Uh, the second method for assessing tumor proliferation is molecular in nature, and it rests on a mean, num uh, mean RNA expression over 11 uh, uh, gene uh, factors that correspond to tumor growth and spread. You can see in this chart the, the correlation between the categorical and molecular scores uh, for ca assessing tumor proliferation. Current methods, however, are limited in their accuracy, their cost, and their efficiency. In particular, mitosis counting is known to be subjective, laborious, and time-consuming, and pathologist categorical grades tend to disagree approximately 25% of the time, which is unacceptable for clinical practice. Moreover, molecular assessment is both costly and requires extensive domain knowledge regarding conducting RNA-seq tests, and is simply not feasible in many hospitals currently, so most patients have to stick with categorical assessment of tumor slides. Finally, most methods currently are inefficient, with clinical slide grading taking over one to four hours for each whole slide image. So there are numerous areas for improvement of these methods. So deep learning is a recently developed machine learning technique involving the creation and application of image-oriented neural networks called convolutional neural networks. They essentially use a large-scale image database to make predictions regarding the implications of certain aspects of those images. So for example, in this project, I used a large database of histology images to make predictions regarding the severity of breast cancer from those slides. The goal of my project was to create a comprehensive pipeline to predict the categorical and molecular proliferation scores from these whole slide images, which can range up to 10 gigabytes in size, and to solve the problems of accuracy, cost, and efficiency that plague current medical practice. So the data set that I used involved three components. The first was uh, known for model evaluation, which consisted of 821 whole slide images with labeled categorical and molecular scores. The second data set consisted of images for tumor localization, with three labeled tumor regions for 148 whole slide images that helped my model identify which regions were tumors and which regions weren't. And finally, my third data set was used for mitosis identification, where uh, the data set consisted of 1,600 plus annotated mitotic figures at the 40x magnification level that were uh, efficiently used to identify mitoses which are predictive of tumor growth and spread. 
So the pipeline that I eventually constructed for assessing tumor proliferation consisted of four primary components, pre-processing, feature identification, feature extraction, and overall clustering and prediction. And in aggregate, in this presentation, I'll be diving into each of these steps in more detail. They're all colored in different colors, as you can see here. The first stage of my pipeline was for whole site image preprocessing, and we'll abbreviate whole site image to WSI um, for the rest of this presentation. The goal of this stage was to standardize input whole site images and extract tissue regions for consistent subsequent processing. This is primarily because the data sets that I used consisted of images from four international pathology centers, and the staining methods, although they use the same chemicals, it normally resulted in different types of color variations that made machine learning models especially difficult to apply. Uh, so here is an example of a downscaled representation of an input whole site image. Figure A represents the images that I traditionally looked at, but on a much smaller scale and with much lower detail. Um, to normalize this image, I employed Bejnordi et al.'s 2015 WSI-CS algorithm for whole side image color standardization, and it transformed the input images, as you can see in figure B, to their output representations using whole side color information. These output representations, as you can clearly visually see, look much more similar and also contain a lot of the differentiating factors of tissue structure that are integral to classifying the severity of tumor growth and spread. And finally, I extracted all relevant tissue features as shown in figure C within the green outlines. So the pre-processing steps essentially took these input images, normalized them, and found the relevant tissue structures for subsequent steps. The st second stage of my model involved two primary components. I first identified relevant tumor areas within these tissue regions, as pathologists often do when they're looking at these tissue slides. And I next isolated relevant mitotic figures for areas of, in, uh, of particular interest. The, reason, reading, re, the reasoning behind this is that mitotic figures or dividing cell nuclei are especially important for identifying the proliferation of cells in tumors, and these are areas are particular areas of interest that can be used for classifying tumor proliferation and growth. So a visual depiction of what I mean by tumor identification is shown here. In particular, figure A represents a lot of the tissue regions that you saw in the previous slide, but there are a few upscale representations at the 40x magnification level. And this is the level that I used for identifying where, uh, which tissues were tumors and which were not tumors. So I developed five machine learning models, uh, three of which were novel and two of which were based on prior techniques, uh, to uh, classify any particular tissue region as tumor or not tumor per, on a pixel-wise basis. So what you see uh, here is figure A, there are 40x magnified tissue regions. They're transformed via my convolutional neural networks to figure C, or, which is to figure C, which I, uh, includes a representation of high confidence and low confidence tumors. Here, high confidence is indicated by the red in the heat map, and low confidence is indicated by the uh, blue in the heat map. And we performed this identification over the entire image on a parallelized processor at the Harvard Medical School. So this process for an entire 8 gigabyte whole slide image at the 40x level took only one to two seconds. The next stage after identifying these tumor areas was to isolate relevant patches from mitotic figure identification and use those patches to make predictions as to where mitoses actually were in the image. You can see again in figure A all the tumor regions in the complete heat map. We can then represent, uh, identify the areas of highest tumor confidence and find mitoses within those areas and subsequently perform a convolutional neural network feature extraction and classification as shown in figure D to identify where all the mitotic figures were in figure E. Finally, after identifying where the mitoses were and the tumors were, we were now ready to perform general feature extraction and overall classification of the images. In particular, uh, my comprehensive feature extraction methods extracted both tumor-specific and general structural features to characterize the entire whole slide images on a level far more detailed than pathologists can with their mitotic count features. So for the patch-based method, my, uh, patches were extracted for k different mitotic figures, and each of these patches were scaled into a feature vector of length 200. So as you can see here, there are three different patches. All of the patches have certain attributes regarding mitotic area, density, and location. And all of those attributes, as well as attributes uh, obtained from the convolutional neural networks, were clustered into a feature vector of length 200. For the whole slide level, I also extracted general structural features regarding the mitoses across the entire whole slide image. So instead of looking at representative patches, I also identified the entire image and classified numerous different attributes of mitoses from that image. Uh, there were 110 features from the whole slide extraction, which when combined with the 200 features from the patch-based extraction resulted in feature vectors of length 310 to characterize mitotic figures on those levels. 
I also performed general feature extraction for my whole slide images. And what this, what this essentially means is I created a whole new type of convolutional neural network to identify and extract structural features across the entire whole slide image. This network was based on a two-stage approach, where the first stage identified uh, whether uh, mitos mitosis or tumor-relevant extracted features, and the second used those features to make predictions regarding the entire class of the whole slide image, regarding one, two, or three in particular. Uh, these attributes that these networks extracted in the second stage represent low-level shapes and structures that are currently undetected by biological features and allowed my method to extract potent biological attributes that are currently not identified in the literature and may prove useful for future classification and identification for breast cancer prognosis. So finally, we now have all these features, 310 regarding mitoses and 1,027 from these general structural extraction that really characterize the entirety of the whole slide image, both in a minute biological attribute sense and a general structural sense that is driven by the fact that we have lots of these images and machine learning models that can use those images to make classifications on an unprecedented scale. So the next step of my pipeline, feature aggregation and prediction, used all these extracted attributes to predict the categorical and molecular attributes of each whole slide image. So you can see here essential, uh, essentially a summary of what we've done. Uh, figure A, again, represents this tumor heat map. And we can extract four different types of attributes, general extraction, tumor localization, and biological and data-driven mitosis, all of which we've already gone over. We can then pipe these through both classification and regression models for identifying the tumor severity class on a scale of one to three, and predicting the molecular proliferation scores, as I discussed before. For categorical classification, a voting classifier was applied whereby the class predicted with the highest frequency across all of my models was selected. And for molecular prediction, all of my results were averaged to obtain a centralized final output. So how does my model really stack up against current states of the art? Well, quantitative tumor and mitosis evaluation was performed by both, current, uh, by both quantitative methods to obtain statistical results, as well as three pathologist experts at the BitMC. And my quantitative uh, metrics for each of the stages of my pipeline truly validated my overall model's performance. My tumor differentiation approach achieved an accuracy of 98.7%, with pathologists agreeing that these tumors were most likely representative of the overall image. And my mitosis detection approaches achieved an accuracy of 99.5%, with an F-score of 0.62, matching current state of the art. Although my general feature extraction methods achieved an accuracy of 57%, they were extremely useful in providing overall results for general classification by the sim simple theory that when you aggregate multiple different unique features, you can obtain a better overall result. So I performed cross-validation for my model on 500 different whole, whole slide images, and I also submitted my model's evaluation for verification on 321 different whole slide images. My confusion matrix at left represents my model's strong predictive model uh, per performance in classes one and three. And class two, which is an intermediate grab bag between those two extreme classes, was predicted with the less confidence as expected. The receiver operating characteristic curves at right further represent the profound predict prognostic potential of my model with an area under the receiver operating characteristic of 0 0.72, further validating my model's overall or 0 0.74, further over, uh, validating my model's overall performance. Both of these results represent state-of-the-art in the field of tumor proliferation assessment. And furthermore, my model's accuracy of 72% is within one standard deviation of current pathologist accuracies of 76%, providing it with significant potential to be used in clinical settings. Furthermore, from, from molecular performance prediction, my, uh, I obtained a correlation coefficient of 0. Um, approximately 0 0.76 between the categorical and molecular expression values with a row value of 0 0.596, indicating my model's profound predictive potential. Again, this represents my uh, state of the art and indicates my model's ability to identify biological attributes from blood samples that are normally taken from these histology slides, the first in the field to ever perform such a task. My model also discovered new biological implications uh, regarding proliferation from static tissue slides. Uh, these are the features that I told you bio biologists haven't yet been able to identify because they simply don't have the time. So, uh, some of these uh, features are, have already been confirmed, but a lot of them ha leave a lot of room for uh, salient development for biological analysis. In particular, I identified over 200 novel features that may open avenues for future biological investigation and improve breast cancer classification. Confirmed features include the m number of mitoses, which is currently related to tumor prolific activity and is the only feature that is currently used in clinical practice as well as the mean mitotic area standard deviation, which is a feature that corresponds to nuclear pleomorphism with ties to breast cancer. 
Uh, novel features include structural, spatial, and uh, distribution attributes of mitoses, as well as other attributes, including cytokinesis, that have currently not been implicated in the severity of breast cancer, but leave room to do so in future in vitro tests. In conclusion, my model is the first ever to integrate tumor localization, mitosis identification, and overall general extraction models to develop a computational breast cancer diagnosis framework. My framework requires only a small tumor tissue sample for pathologist level categorical prediction and unprecedented insight into the molecular underpinnings of tumor growth and spread. Running in under two seconds at a fraction of current costs, my model performs at 14,000 times the speed of current pathologists with the same accuracy, providing lots of implications in terms of clinical practice and facilitating the low cost early detection of breast cancer for effective, targeted and, effective and targeted treatments in the future. In terms of future work, I hope to apply my model to generalize to other types of cancerous tumors and diseases and perform ex vivo investigation of some of these obtained novel features to investigate and potentially develop new biological pathways representing breast cancer growth and spread. In terms of clinical applications, my model may be applied to frozen biopsies as a second opinion for pathologist graders to improve their accuracies and as an initial screening examination for large-scale hospitals that simply don't have the bandwidth and the staff needed to diagnose numerous patients, especially in developing areas. With additional biological and clinical verification, I am certain that my approach will enable the rapid classification and specific biomarker identification of other diseases and disorders. I'd like to acknowledge the following individuals for their contributions to my work, in particular my mentor, Dr. Dayan Wang at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, as well as all of this, uh, these other faculty for their contributions to the project. I'd additionally like to thank Ms. Chetty, Dr. Nelson, Mr. Pistacci, and Mr. Spenner at the Harker School, all of whom who pro provided invaluable feedback regarding my presentation and my paper. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my family and my sister for their contributions to my project and providing me coffee, staying up late, and dealing with all the stress that comes with research. Thank you. So now we'll be doing a Q&A. The first question is, what were the layers of your CNN? What was the activation function you used? And what libraries did you use? OK, that's very specific. Sure. So um, there's a paper on archive that has a lot of these details. I use nine different convolutional networks, so I can't give you specifications of any particular one. And as you probably know, there are lots of different variations. So I use some of the classical networks, GoogleNet, AlexNet, but they didn't allow for specific identification of biomarkers at the level that I required. So the two networks that I developed, one of them had uh, six layers with 21.1 thousand parameters, and the second had 12 layers with 4.5 million parameters. But the networks that I used ranged from 21 thousand parameters to uh, 1.01 billion parameters. So there's a large variety in the types of networks that I used for the particular tasks. And in terms of libraries, I used Python 2.7 with Theano, Cafe, um, lasagna, and a little bit of TensorFlow because it came out midway through my project. The second question is, how did you learn deep learning? Okay, so this is also an interesting question. Deep learning is a pretty recent field. Uh, the advancements really started with Jeff Hinton in 1960, but they expanded pretty rapidly from the ImageNet Challenge in 2012, which Dr. Lee talked about pretty extensively. So uh, the way I personally learned deep learning is I started with the Coursera curse from Andrew Ng uh, like three or four years back. Uh, and then I read some resources online. And a lot of it's just trial and error. So there are libraries that are available right now that allow you to experiment a lot with models. And although uh, Macs generally don't have GPUs, you can um, definitely train sample toy networks and learn by doing. So a lot of what I did was just based on just testing out networks, trying to figure out what goes where, and also reading a couple of books online. There was one recently published uh, by Goodfellow et al. that is pretty detailed in deep learning. So I'd recommend taking a look at that if you're interested in the field. The third question is, how will your advances in assessment of tumor proliferation impact healthcare? Also, can your research be applied to other cancers and diseases? Sure, so in its current state, uh, the, the pipeline that I developed is pretty much generalizable to any sort of cancerous tumor or disease uh, from a histology point of view. So the pipeline that I developed looks at a few key features. It looks at uh, mitoses, it looks at tumors, it looks at general structural attributes. So of course, you'd have to perform transfer learning to move that sort of model and relearn the weights for a different type of cancer. But the pipeline that I've developed is fully generalizable and uses biological and data-driven features for a holistic approach to identify um, cancerous illnesses. Um, and in terms of other types of cancers, uh, 
Once again, uh, the pipeline is generalizable and can be applied to other diseases and illnesses. And in particular, the model that I've developed for breast cancer is currently, uh, where I'm currently in talks with other types of other doctors uh, at hospitals to try to use this in initial alpha beta tests uh, to aid their pathologists. I don't think we're re really at the stage at which computers can replace, um, uh, uh, replace pathologists and the whole a attitude of the uh, hospital that I was working at and my lab in particular was human first. So we still need a lot of human care and patient treatment and one-to-one -one doctor patient interaction. But at the same time, these methods can certainly help advance the field and advance current diagnoses and provide more accurate diagnoses in the future. The next question is, do you plan on doing future research in college on this topic? Yeah, certainly. So uh, regardless of whatever college I attend, I'm certainly interested in applied mathematics and computer science. And so I really hope to continue my work with deep learning, with computer vision, and also more generally in other types of fields that deep learning is being applied to. For example, natural language processing, scene recognition, uh, region localization, all of these types of areas, they all are built on some, the same fundamentals. And I definitely am interested in applying those types of fundamentals to lots of different fields in college. How did you find internships in the summer for your research? Um, so there are numerous different ways to find internships. There are organized research programs that are run by Ms. Chetty that I would consider uh, definitely applying for. There are also other ways to get in contact with professors. Lots of professors aren't really as interested or don't have as much time to work with high school students, but if you send a quick email to 10, 15, 20 different professors, you might get lucky with one or two, and that's all you really need, to get in contact with one professor who's willing to work with you, and everything kind of just kicked off from there. So my personal experience, I sent a few emails out, and I was lucky enough to get an immediate response from Dr. Beck, who was really fabulous in helping me get set up at the lab, work at the lab, and really understand the environment and uh, get to work on my project. So that was a really great experience. How did you get interested in computer science? Did you ever do a wet lab based on this topic? Okay, so I've never actually performed wet lab experiments for uh, histology slides, primarily because that requires a level of clearance that a high school student traditionally can't obtain. But I uh, do believe that the work that I've done will catalyze a lot, of the, a lot of wet lab work, specifically in the field of identifying the features and biological pathways that correspond to those features um, that haven't yet been discovered in the literature. So I definitely feel that wet lab work is necessary and should be integrated with the data-driven work that I've been doing to further the advancement of uh, treatment and clinical care. Um, personally, I've really been interested in the theoretical aspects of computer science. So the work that I've done over the past four years is much more focused on the uh, more like uh, theoretical notions, so developing networks, which networks work better, identifying and optimizing hyperparameters, and uh, that sort of model. So that's why I found this pipeline particularly interesting. But I certainly do believe that if you are interested in working with clinical applications or developing uh, sorts of models that can be applied on a patient setting, I would certainly recommend working on both wet lab and on a computational perspective. So that's all the time we have for today. Thanks, Manan, for your wonderful presentation, and thank you all for attending.